Hello, thank you very much, Candice, for the introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone, for this uh, Kernel CI webinar. I called it Travel Guide 2024 to basically go through all the different parts of Kernel CI and try to um, get oriented, uh, find some orientation uh, around it. Um, so I'll start with um, not really a personal introduction, but more about my involvement in the, in the Kernel CI project over the past few years. Um, so I started in 2017 as a um, contributor. Um, so I um, implemented the automated bisections uh, support for boot testing. Um, so whenever uh, a platform failed, started failing to boot, um, it was detected as a regression. Um, and typically with Linux Next, it was very difficult to find why that happened. So I worked on, on implementing an automated bisection for that. Um, and gradually, starting from there, I got more involved with the project. It was still quite early days for the project, so lots of things were not really in place. So I had to kind of fix things myself, and then I started taking on more responsibilities. Um, so then I started implementing support for functional testing. So that's more than you know, not just booting, but doing more things after you boot it. So basically, running things like a self test, uh, LTP, all the uh, you know IGT, all these classic things. Um, then the project became, um, Kernel CI became a Linux Foundation project in 2019, and I was the chair of the technical steering committee um, in 2019, and Kevin Hellman was um, uh, chair of the uh, board at the time. Um, then the second year I was, I became um, chair of the board as well, uh, instead of, you know, to take over from, from Kevin at that point. Um, that was quite interesting also because it was very much around setting things up. Uh, the project has been had been um, still very small, and now all of a sudden it became part of the Linux Foundation, but I'll get into the more details of that a bit later. Um, and one of the things after that was to basically evolve, uh, how do we uh, transition from the rather small project that it was before to something that will actually uh, deliver on what you know its mission from from a Linux Foundation project. Um, that's where the the new API concepts came from uh, by you know consulting different people in the kernel community and and all around. Um, then after that, I got really busy with Chrome OS support, uh, adding support basically to run kernel CI tests on Chromebook hardware and doing Chrome OS builds with the full user space and kernel testing, of course. So that took a lot of time and kind of diverted a bit the focus from the you know the new API and the core features to really get the Chrome OS stuff um, uh, up to speed. Um, and then, um, yeah, in 2023, so last year was really more about bootstrapping things to actually get the new API in place, get the new web dashboard developed um, to go with it and created, creating a roadmap and setting things up for that to happen. Um, and then at the end of 2023, um, I decided to leave Collabra. So I didn't mention that, but I, all that all these years before, I'd been doing this as a, a Collabra employee. Um, then I decided to uh, resign from Collabra. And then now I'm also um, as moving out of Kernel CI gradually, if you want. So, uh, that's the theme for me this year, or at least the beginning of 2024, is to uh, uh, plan for a succession for all these things to um, with other people. So that's just an overview. Um, I'd like to say also, if, if you have any questions, please ask them at any point. And then at the end of each slide, you know, we can have um, a small break and answer any questions if it makes more sense to answer them uh, while we're looking at something relevant. Okay, so you have made a small drawing. <laughs> so that's basically that. Um, the map uh, for this webinar. So first we'll do a history path. I've already explained a bit of the history, but we'll kind of um, fast forward uh, 10 years in a few minutes. Um, then places of interest, so that's the important things to know about kernel CI now. And then more like, a, and the third part is more like a viewpoint about the future, like well this year and potential plans for the longer term. So I've explained it here in three parts as well to keep track, keep better track of the structure of the of the, um, the webinar. 
So this is the um, you know time arrow. So as you can see, it started in 2014, so three years before I joined the project. Um, that's actually when the first commits in GitHub can be found or kernel CI. Maybe some ideas were there before, but that's basically when it started, which is exactly 10 years ago. Um, then I would say around, so initially it was very, very basic and uh, it was really around the ARM, ARM community and um, there were lots of things. It took a long time basically to um, to start really producing something useful because the um, it was all done by um, by my kernel maintainers on the you know in the spare time. So it took about maybe two years, I'd say, until you get to 2016, and that's when there's a more like reliable system that's doing boot testing regularly and sending emails to uh, public mailing lists and uh, yeah, building boots. Um, and so it keeps growing in 2016, 17, 18. And then in 2019, that's when it becomes a Linux Foundation project. Um, and that's where there's a new initiative called KCIDB, um, mostly by a couple of people from Red Hat initially, and now it's really carried by the whole project. Uh, and that's where the um, the scope of the project changes. So that's where the start of the redesign comes from. And then 2022 onwards, uh, that's when the implementation of the new design, if you want, um, is uh, is actually taking place. Okay, so um, now I'll go through all these phases a bit, a little bit more. Um, so initially there was Kevin in, uh, Kevin Hillman and Olaf Johansson uh, who are still um, maintainers around the, the ARM uh, SOC um, um, subsystems in, in the kernel. And at that time you have to, well, 10, year, 10 years ago, there were still, there were already some Android phones and things like that. I'm not sure about Android actually. <laughs> it, it was becoming a bit more popular, but it's nothing like now. So the um, ARM support, like kernel builds on the ARM, for the ARM platform, kept kept breaking all the time. Uh, so that was one of the first things to do uh, to fix, if you want, with kernel CI. There was real big incentive to have a CI to continuously do builds with mainline. Um, so that's what that's what they started, really as independent kernel maintainers. Um, and then they were joined by a few people from Linaro, although it was not a Linaro project, it's just a few people from Linaro happened to give them a hand if you want. So Tyler, who provided some of the original kernel builders in his garage, <laughs> um, and Milo, who developed the, um, the original backend and frontend, like the, the web stack, um, which is still uh, online right now. Um, so it was mostly about doing kernel builds and then boot testing on embedded ARM platforms. So here you can see some of the original labs. Well, this picture is probably from 2016, 17. You can already see a bunch of Chromebooks. The, the one on the left is in um, Crybrow's lab. And the one on the right was um, Kevin Hellman's original lab with lots of small dev boards everywhere. Um, so yeah, so during this 2016, 17, 18, this is about three years, that's where the project really uh, grew uh, in terms of the original, I call it the classic system, if you want. So you have lots of CI systems for the kernel. Some are, some are more public than others. Um, and kernel CI was really uh, designed to do that. So to do the you know ARM builds, booting on ARM platforms, uh, and try to do that pretty well. Um, so that's what happened during that time. And then in 2019, uh, well, mostly Kevin Hillman still, you know, he started the project basically. And then he also did a lot of uh, legwork to uh, find members to launch the um, uh, kernel CI project. So that was officially done at Open Source Summit 2019. Um, and one of the reasons why this happened is uh, uh, Greg Krohartman was uh, re receiving lots of different um, reports uh, for stable reviews, you know, every time there's a, a new release candidate for a stable kernel, um, all the fixes are sent to the mailing list for review. And some people would reply to say this works, there's a problem, and he would get a very uh, patchy um, set of answers from very different people. 
with different CI systems doing different kinds of things, it was a bit difficult to um, uh, have a, a full picture of the quality of the kernel, basically. Um, so the, the main reason for kernel CI to become a Linux Foundation project was that there was a need for at least one project to become the one CI system if you want to become them the main one, if you the main one for for mainline. Um, and I think kernel CI probably got chosen because it was not specific to a particular product, like it was not really owned by the company or, um, you know, it was not just for one particular use case, so it could then grow to cover the whole kernel. Um, and then eventually it was launched with a, a, a five members, which we'll go through um, a bit later. So it's kind of like having one CI to rule them all, <laughs> uh, but it's really a collaborative effort. And here you can see the current members, which are basically the same as the founding ones. There was also foundries.io as a member of the first tier. Um, and uh, yeah, I think they left off a little while. So basically now we still have uh, Bailey Bray, which is the company uh, where Kevin Hillman works. Uh, civil Infrastructure Platform, uh, which is another Linux Foundation project, and they care about very long-term stable kernels to be used um, in civil infrastructure where you can't upgrade kernels. Um, and Collabora, uh, where I worked for, for seven years. And Google, that's also one of the reasons why there's um, a lot of support for Chrome OS is because Google is one of the members. Um, Microsoft, um, who really were, I had a big uh, interest in, in stable kernels. And at the time we had Sasha, uh, Sasha Levine, who was um, working at Microsoft in a maintain of uh, stable with Greg Rotman. And Red Hat, who um, have their own uh, CI system called CKI, and they worked, uh, they, they provided, they had, well, spent a lot of effort to help with uh, what's called KCIDB, which we'll go through a bit later to have a central database. So they all had like a slightly different um, reason for being a member, which is uh, a very nice way to start if you want. Um, and uh, yeah, we're still looking for new members. Now we have, you know, each member provides a, a yearly contribution um, to to the budget for the project. So we have, we have a budget to do things um, I didn't detail them here, but like, you know, we can pay for contractors or infrastructure and stuff like that. Um, but having more variety, I think, in, in the members and showing that new members can join the project now, I think would be very um, positive. So there are a few um, potential ones. Um, there's also, um, yeah, of course, there's an email you can, well, that's not the link here, it's a, a screenshot, but if you go on the kernelci.org, website on a home page you'll see this at the bottom and you can just send an email if you're interested if you want to discuss um how you know if your company would like to join um of course you can also uh, reach out in other ways now um yeah so the members also provide um cloud uh, compute services like uh, you know microsoft azure and, and google cloud which um, which is used to build kernels, and also people uh, from member companies, um, be, uh, you know, have become um, maintainers of the project, um, and you know, treasurer and chair and other roles. It's really important for the sustainability of the project. So, so if one member decided to leave, for example, it'd be difficult uh, after uh, after a while, you know, to uh, sustain the project. So having few more members, I think, would would be really a way to um, secure it. Um, okay, then back to the drawing board in 2020, 2021. Um, so because it became, because the project became part of the Linux Foundation and its mission got bigger, uh, there was a need to take a look again at um, what it was doing, what it needed to do, and how to get from where it was to where it would need to be. So basically going from um, ARM embedded um, focused system to a scalable, uh, flexible framework, if you want, for any subsystem of the, any use case of, of the kernel to be, uh, to be covered potentially. 
Um, no, I mean, initially more uh, more test suites got enabled, such as uh, KSL testing and IGT and LTP, um, and what we call baseline checks. Uh, that's like some scripts to verify that drivers and devices have initialized correctly and things like this. Um, then, yeah, then the, there was a lot of effort put in place to add from REST test support. There's even a, like a slightly separate uh, instance instance of uh, kernel CI just to show the Chrome REST results um, with a dedicated set of uh, builders for Chrome OS kernels. Um, and KCIDB got launched at the same time, so I've mentioned it a couple of times. Um, so this is really just to gather uh, results from lots of different CI systems such as uh, you know, Sysbot and Zero Day um, and Gen2 kernel CI initially. I mean, there's, there's a, we'll go through this again in more detail soon, a bit later in this webinar, but there's, there's a whole list and it keeps moving. And anybody can, um, even like individual maintainers, can send when you're individual developers. If you, have, if you happen to be running tests automatically, you can um, sign up if you want and send your data to KCIDB. And yeah, then the uh, new API, which also implies a new web dashboard. So basically the new web stack uh, needed, uh, that needed to be a bit, to be um, defined. So the, the first step was to gather requirements from the community. Uh, so that's why we did a community survey. Uh, that was in 2020, I believe. Yes. Uh, this slide is from a presentation at Linux Plumbers Conference in 2020. It's also uh, available on the NCI.org website in a blog post. Uh, so this is a summary. I mean, the, we had like um, quite a lot of questions, and there's a link here on the blog post. Um, so the three main takeaways, if you want, from from that were. Um, uh, it's really important to test patches. That's also called as, also known as uh, pre-merge testing, because initially kernel CI was only doing, was still kind of is only looking at Git trees. So once patches have been applied, so it bypasses all the review stage on mailing lists, and that's really critical. Um, it's really difficult to do as well because there's lots of volume of emails. Um, and many technical challenges around this, um, but it, this came out as one really important thing that kernel developers and maintainers would really like to see. Um, and then extending long running coverage, as it's called, um, typically, especially for stable kernels, I think that's where it was really important to have maybe you know one or you know twenty four hours or forty eight hours of like testing envelope, so you can run. Things like FS tests that can take a long time to cover all the possibilities. Some performance benchmarks can take a long time too. If you wanted to run all of LTP, maybe that's not very. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's also difficult to find a, the best test because it, in principle you could run forever. Um, but people express the um, the need for doing deeper testing because these are things that are really difficult to do by hand. Say so also if you know um, even if you have even if you have the time to run lots of tests, you can maybe just run it on one platform. Or it's hard to run things in parallel if you don't have um, a bigger infra infrastructure. So that's really something that people would you know expressed as um as a requirement if you want to be able to rely on on bigger infrastructure to find bugs that are really hard to find by hand. And improving the web dashboard. Um, I think about three quarters of people um, said they would be happy to use a web dashboard if there was one. Um, a small amount of people, maybe like 20%, I think, said they would not use the web dashboard at all. They would just use email and command line tools. Um, but a majority of people would be really happy to use a web dashboard if you provided the right features for their workflow. And that means a, a fair amount of customization, like being able to set up your own queries to look at the data in a particular way. Um, and, but that was like the starting point to say, okay, we need to uh, define this better. Yeah. So that was, uh, yes? Would you be able to show the dashboard? Um, I think I put that uh -huh. link in there. That might actually uh, set the context for a lot of people. Um, yes. 
uh As however you are speaking um... yes <laughs> can you see this now this is a kernel ci website yes okay uh here there's a link to dashboard this is the old dashboard uh, that was initially created 10 years ago and got upgraded a little bit uh, to, to show test results. Um, but um, what I'm talking about is there's a need for a better web dashboard than that. <laughs> so this solves some of the issues, um, but it doesn't have the level of um, flexibility that you would normally need. So maybe we can see what the limitations are. So for example, if here you have a list of trees. It's actually possible to look to sort the data by hardware type, um, but it's really clunky. There's there's a SSC page here, which kind of worked well enough in the beginning with a few types of ARM boards, um, but now I'm not even going to go through it. Now you can play with this if you want, um, but it can take a long time to load and it's a bit quirky to use. Typically, for example, if you want to look at mainline test results, you can click on, on these um, numbers here. That shows you all the test results uh, for the different yeah, tests that were run. When there's a red triangle, it's when there was a regression. Um, so let's see if there's like a, can also, a, a self test few text regression. So you can see on the platforms that regressed. Um, and with this, you can see, you know, you can see the regressions. This one is a new one. It will tell you if it regressed for a long time or not. If you also do anything that the website doesn't provide out of the box, then it's really difficult to to add uh, to add new features to this. Um, so sometimes people have said, uh, as a maintainer, I, I would like to be able to see regressions that are on my branch and not on mainline. So for example, um, here we have Arndt, uh, Arndt Bergman's tree. Uh, and Mark Brown, you know, a few maintainers like this here, they base their branch on top of mainline, like a RC2 attack, for example. And if you look here, there's like 20 regressions on ARM's uh, branch, and mainline has 46. Uh, well, maybe because they got introduced later or coverage is different. But what maintainers don't really know is if you open... Um, I'm just giving you an example of the limitations of this kind of web dashboard. If you look here, uh, well, first of all, it can take a while to load. Um, if you look at um, regressions for a particular test, you don't really know if these regressions were um, created on, or, you know, started to happen with the, um, with the commits on your maintainer branch or if they were already there in, in mainline. Okay, well, there's also a performance problem. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so, so could, yes. would you be able to show the builds part? I think um, yeah. I don't. I I understand understand that we have to improve this, and then also I just I think it would be good to show what we are currently what is being done currently, and then yes. you have an impressive list of socks. Um, so you probably want to show that as well. Yeah, well, there's lots of performance issues with the uh, uh, socks tab. Actually, I have um, I have a slide a little bit later to talk about the the old web dashboard, so maybe we can go through it there. Okay, um, sounds good. But at this point, I really wanted to highlight the fact that this this is the old one. There's okay. a big need as part of well, yes, uh, as part of the community survey, we uh, found that it was there was a big need for an improvement from okay. that. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, okay. The that's. A slide from FOSDEM 2021 with the first year as uh, Kernel CI, as uh, with first year with Kernel CI as a Linux Foundation project. So the first three months, I guess, in, in October, November, December 2022, uh, sorry, 20, 2019, um, were basically yeah, finding out um, how to set up a project more than anything else. At the end of it, we had a mission statement, which you can find on the website. Uh, that's basically now, now we know basically what the project is all about in terms of long-term mission and goal. Um, then, uh, yeah, KCIDB started having a web dashboard in, in 2020, um, which is currently kind of offline. There's, a, there's some issues with that. We'll, we'll hope to have the new web dashboard for the KCIDB uh, data set 
so I can't really show it to you right now. There's a slide a bit later that shows the snapshot, but I can't show you a live version of, of the web dashboard right now. Um, then we started having um, more resources from Microsoft Azure. Uh, since Microsoft was a founding member, one of the things that they also did was to provide the project with infrastructure, which is really helpful. Um, and Google also did that, uh, but it happened before. <laughs> um, yeah, functional testing really happened after that too. I guess it became more important um, as the project was growing to really cover all the, all the classic test suites. And the community survey, which I just showed, uh, was done around that time frame as well, beginning of 2020s summer. Then we started adding support for Kubernetes to run kernel to, to do kernel builds. And then Linux Plumbers is mentioned here. Uh, that's where there were lots of talks about kernel CI. Um, I mean, I can go through that in a bit more detail, but that was also where it was, I think it was a real milestone in terms of discussing things with the kernel community to say, now the project is a Linux Foundation project. It's been maybe useful until now, but from now on, it needs to rethink itself. So that's why it was really important to discuss with lots of people. So we had um, birds of a feather above, uh, above session at um, Plumbers in 2020 to, to uh, really discuss these kinds of things with lots of kernel people in the room. Um, so that was kind of related to the survey, if you want, but more in a live uh, context at, at Plumbers. And yeah, Google Sysbot started sending data to KCIDB and gone a bit closer to kernel CI. So quite a lot of interest and things started really taking up, uh, taking off at, at that point. And then, uh, yeah, well, that was 2020. And 2021 was basically the, you know, ramping up from there. Uh, but then in 2022 and 2023, that's when we really identified what the new API and pipeline, as I like to call it, um, would need to look like. So one of the key things is that it really has to be flexible. So what came out um, as a result is that we can't really just use an off-the-shelf CI system. Some people said, how about uh, BuildBot? How about this uh, one called Concourse CI? And previously, Kernel CI had been using Jenkins, which was very fashionable 10 years ago. Um, and there's other things like GitLab CI and GitHub with... Um, so all these things can be used, but none of them is really well suited for testing the whole kernel in the way that kernel CI was aiming to be able to do. And also providing a way for maintainers and kernel developers to gradually, gradually uh, change their workflow from um, manual testing to automation that needed some very specific, um, uh, very specific um, tools, if you want. I think one of the reasons also why we decided that, um, why, why we established that we needed a, a new type of framework is if you look at the history of the kernel, it's, it's a very special type of open source project because it's arguably one of the biggest uh, truly open source project as one big repository, if you want. Um, and I like to take the example of, of Git, for example. You know, in, initially, uh, kernel development was done with only tables and patch files. Um, then I, I think it started using something called BitKeeper for a while, uh, but that didn't really work out. So what happened then is a special tool called, a new tool called Git was created precisely to answer the needs of the kernel community. And it also happened to be very useful for lots of other, other things. And, and then GitHub happened and all that. Um, but I think it showed that the kernel is a very special type of project, so you needed special types of tools. So Git solved that. Um, and I think from a kernel CI point of view, maybe it's less of a less generic, less less universal thing um, to solve. But it needs a special tool as well to be able to test it, because every part of the kernel is almost like a small community with different ways of testing. So it needs that. Uh, you know, Git is very distributed. It has it's very flexible, and I think that's what also what we need in terms of a CI framework, a CI system. So if, if you have to use one server, if you have to use one framework, then you'll 
so sooner or later you hit hit some limitations and some people will not be able to use it um so how do we do that well i, I didn't um you know i didn't want to go into too many details about the new api design um but maybe one of the key things is to have a database of course with an api to send data read data that's kind of classic but also make it make it quite um I just you know tune it for the type of use cases for for kernel testing um and on top of that have um event mechanism so that you can um, receive an event whenever for example a new kernel build is available so if you have a um a test form you can subscribe to receive events so or you can filter to receive a particular type of event so if you have um I don't know, like a um, a test farm with ARM platforms or x86 platforms, you might want to only receive builds for that particular type or even with a particular kernel config. Once you re re receive the event to say there's a build available, then you can download it and automatically test it in your platform and send the results um, to the to the API. So that way, anybody can uh, set up their own client for the API anywhere, in their, even in the in the private uh, private networks, receive events, run some tests, and send the results to the API. Um, there's a typical use case for that. Uh, we work, we discussed it with um, several companies who have their own um, test systems that are not necessarily public, or maybe they are public but very sp very specific. Um, I mean, yeah, Pengatronics have something called LabGrid, and that's open source. Uh, but mostly only Pengatronics use it, and so Kernel CI didn't support it natively. Having this event uh, mechanism means they could uh, receive events and start running things in, in LabGrid, so that's one of the things they started looking into. Uh, it hasn't finished, it hasn't been completely implemented yet, but it's you know one of the steps. Anyway, so I can go through some more details if you want. Uh, maybe in the q and if you have particular questions, some of it is explained on the on the uh, website. Some of it is still not completely uh, set in stone. Um, but that's the kind of issues that was uh, that, that the new API is trying to address, so being really flexible in order to be able to kind of run anything anywhere and let people submit data. And that, that also uh, clarified a lot of things about what the new web dashboard would look like. So in terms of being flexible now, we had an idea of the type of data that would be there, the type of um, workflows or user flows, as they're called, uh, on the web dashboard. And yeah, that took a bit longer than a few minutes. Um, so coming soon, 2024, that's where we are now. Uh, so since I left and I was TSC chair as well as board chair now, and there's new people who've come in uh, or who've taken up these roles. Uh, well, I'd like to see also Shua has just joined the Kernel CITSC last week. So, hey, congratulations, Shua. It's great to have you, um, you. part of the team. Uh, and then, um, yeah, the roadmap adjustments. So, in 2023, we made some roadmap about how to get a new API developed and a new web dashboard. And a few things are being readjusted now. Um, and UX analysis is something that's happening right now. So, we did. Um, uh, RFP a request for proposals to have people who are more skilled into more skilled in web development to really write um, specs and maybe make a prototype or a demo if you want for in, for the new web dashboard because that's like web development is is, is typically a skill that was missing from the um, kernel CI team. So that, you know, that's the things we know so far in 2024. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we can go through the, the future a bit more. So what we have now, so yeah, that's the legacy system. Uh, with the cobweb, cobweb in the corner. The um, So it's still online, like I showed a bit earlier. And it, well, it definitely does a lot of builds for uh, Linux Next. It does maybe about 200. 200 bills for you know, for each revision every day. You know, there's a new Linux Next tag every day, and there's about 200 bills uh, from kernel CI for that um, with GCC and Clang and actually 
two versions of Clangdale um, and Rust support. And it has lots of architectures. Some are even not listed here, but it does, you know, all the main ones and even slightly less than many ones. And yeah, it's doing a, lot, a growing number of tests. Uh, so KSL tests, LTP, IGT, I've mentioned them before. There's um, specific ones like cross CC is listed on the, on the snapshot here. That's a Chrome OS embedded controller. Basically any test that is open source and tests a uh, part of the kernel and can be run on mainline is eligible. So if you want to, if you have your own test or if you want to work on adding an existing test suite, if you want to kernel CI, that can be done um, as long as they meet these criteria. The um, the only downside, no, the, the only kind of um, hurdle right now is the, um, the legacy system this one is meant to be retired. Um, so it's a bit difficult to justify uh, putting lots of effort into trying to make it do more things when we know it's going to be retired. So if if this is like a stepping stone to get the tests running with a new API and the new and the new system, then it's that's good. But if it's a lot of work that's gonna be deleted in a few months time or maybe one year. Uh, that's where you know we need to be a bit careful. It's probably one of the reasons why some things have been kind of put on pause as well. Um, and yeah, it does regression tracking. So that's all the red numbers you can see on the screenshot. Um, so yeah, green is for passing, yellow is for failing, like things that have always failed or things that didn't run, and red is for things that were passing and have started failing at some point. Um, and bisections are not mentioned on the web dashboard, uh, but they run by the legacy system. So for every regression, typically, not quite every regression, uh, but in principle, every, every test uh, regression can be bisected, and then an email will be sent. Um, so this is a slide I've used in a previous presentation. So the, the idea is to have, there's only one Linux kernel mainline, uh, and the idea is to have only one CI system to cover it. Of course, that's not just like one monolithic system. It's an umbrella of systems, if you want, because there's one kernel with lots of subsystems. So we need one CI system with lots of submodules, if you want to call them, and let the subsystem maintainers be able to um, own these different parts like they own the code. Ideally, they would be able to also own the um, system that runs the tests. And kernel CI is not focused on any particular product or any type of architecture. So um, that's why also it is eligible for being, it makes sense for it to be the, the one the CI system. And it's based on the, what we've called uh, for a little while now, the um, open testing philosophy. So it's a bit like open source philosophy where you share the code, but here it's about sharing test related things. So there's um, the test software, of course, itself. So um, sharing just the test suites uh, but also sharing hardware pools um so sh sharing test farms so that for example you can let other people run their tests on your hardware and you can run your test on other people's hardware uh, and grouping the results into a single database so you can compare all these things or you can um, see you know patterns and uh, yeah, have, have this collaboration to see all the results together in one place. In the same way that you um, have code contributions in one place, you can have the data from the test results. And it's community driven. Um, so maybe every um, every test contributor will have very specific needs. Specific needs. So some people will be running tests on their own products in their own farm. But if you, contrib if you contribute all these results together, then that's how you create a community based on, on different individuals and different specific use cases. And then the project makes decisions that make sense for the whole community. Exactly like for open source, if you want to send a change, for example, that may be because you really care about that, like you want to add support for a particular device or you want to change a feature in a kernel that will you know that's something you need for your own use 
private use case, I would want to say. Um, as long as that works for everyone, it doesn't break other things, it adds value to everyone, then it will eventually be accepted. Okay, it's the same with, with testing. So everybody has their own particularly integrated reasons for doing testing. Um, and when you combine all of them, then you, you have this community. Uh, so yeah, th this image is like an eclipse between, like, you know, the, the kernel development is, is happening and the idea is to align testing to have coverage of all of it. It's not really to remove the light, but more, <laughs> that's the limit of the metaphor if you want, but it's trying to align things. Um, because there's still the other side of the of the moon that's <laughs> in the sun. Um, Okay, so yeah, KCIDB, I wanted to um, spend a little bit more time on this. So here's a, a screenshot from um, the proof of concept web dashboard that it's based on Grafana. So it just loads the data directly from the database into graphs. Uh, it's used to basically have some kind of insight into what is in the database. And you can see it has you know, tens of thousands of test results sent every day. Um, and you can see it has even more uh, hardware uh, uh, CPU architectures being built, and you know, it could be thousands of uh, test results and build results. So it's quite big, it can scale pretty well. Um, so it's receiving results from Red Hat uh, CKI, from the main kernel CI pipelines, from Sysbot Tuck Suite, which is a Linaro service. Anybody using it can tick a box and all the tests all the bills and tests that they're running, uh, the results that will be sent to KCIDB. Um, there's one issue with this web dashboard. If if it's public, then it sends too many queries to the um, uh, database, uh, and then it causes some infrastructure limitation. So initially it was public, and then we hit some problems. So now it's private until there's a fix for that, like a, basically a cache database. Um, and as soon as that's resolved, the next bit is to add support for issue tracking, um, which I won't go into too much detail here, but basically every CI system, or lots of CI systems have a way to track problems. Like we talked about the kernel CI dashboard, it can track regressions. That's kind of very basic. You don't know when it's resolved and all that, but some CI systems have more information around, around that. And having all this type of issue tracking in case ADB will also really help. Okay, um, new API, it's still um, in what we call the early access data set. It's like beta, uh, beta testing. So it does very small, a very small number of things. It does only x86 builds, as far as I'm aware, maybe it started doing a bit more, but I think it's basically um, x86 builds, boot testing and KUnit. And you can see this, um, graph here, which is also taken directly from the database, so it's not like a proper web dashboard. Um, you can see the number of um, of tests. So it's very small a number, like you know, tens of of results. Um, normally, the original roadmap was that it would be um, the new production system, the new system in production for kernel CI at the beginning of March, um, but that didn't happen. Lots of things got slowed down and put on hold. So, uh, so it's still at the early early stage and um yeah the, the x analysis work is to design a new web dashboard to actually show this data a bit better um now yeah i like to mention this quote from Linus Torvalds uh about a growing ecosystem so um to say you know at some point in an interview he said it was uh, that the kernel was a social project and that's really interesting because it's well, I can show you the next slide if you want. You have all the different parts of the ecosystem interacting with each other. And now we have more and more uh, actors, if you want, in, in this ecosystem. So more kernel developers are starting to look at kernel CI, more you know, different ways of testing also have started to happen. Um, so that's really growing. I mean, we can look into this into more detail, but the idea is to, the idea is to have um, a full loop, so between people who write the code and write the tests, at some point they get some feedback via a web dashboard or email notifications. And right now these, <clears throat> these two things happen kind of asynchronously, so the kernel development will carry on regardless of the test results. But as test results become more uh, 
more stable and more um, more useful, people will start relying on them more. And at some point, the hope is that well, the the idea would be to uh, require test results to be good enough before making um, before, for example, adding a patch to a branch or before releasing a, a new kernel version. Um, so here's an example of um, a fairly recent addition to the landscape, which is a regspot. And now some kernel CI regressions are sent to regspot. It's not very clear how often and how and when, but here I've put an example from about a year ago. Um, I think it's still pretty manual, but it's, that's really something that is a potential um, thing to work on. And GitLab CI, I think we have Helen here um, in, in the attendees. Uh, so Helen sent um, um, a, a patch series on, on the mailing list. Uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe, about adding initial support for testing um, mainline kernel with GitLab CI. Uh, there's a demo video, which I've put a link here. And it's not a kernel CI system, not a kernel CI tool, uh, but it's sort of related to kernel CI. It's like a, a cousin project, if you want. It's not very clear to me right now how these two things relate. Um, but it's definitely, at least at the level of something like, you know, like Regsbot or CKI or Zero Day, all these things that are part of the uh, part of the ecosystem. Of course, they, um, they, they are relevant to kernel CI. And um, yeah, part of another category, if you want, of um, members of the ecosystem are organizations. So some of the big companies who rely a lot on, on the Linux kernel, like you know Meta, for example, have started working a bit closer to kernel CI, especially for BPF CI. Of course, um, you know Meta care a lot about networking, and they have lots of kernel people who work on BPF and all sorts of network related things. Um, so they've created a patchwork-based system for, for BPF. Um, and now they've uh, started helping, uh, they started contributing to kernel CI to the new system to to have um, pre-merge testing or patch testing, uh, which is something I mentioned earlier as a result of the um, community survey we did several years ago, well, three years ago. So that's a really good example um, of a new um, new type of input, if you want, from the community. Uh, Pangatronics I mentioned a while ago in this in this webinar um, because they have uh, the lab grid uh, test farms they wanted to integrate. A bit similar with TI. Um, there's been a few public mentions of um, you know them wanting to run some tests. And ARM, of course, as well. Uh, I've been running you know things with uh, with kernel type for a while. Um, you know, we've been discussing things with them. Um, there's, they're already sending results from tech suites. I think it would be interesting to see if we can do more collaboration between um, their tech suite system and kernel CI. Um, and, but yeah, some of these things are also currently slowed down a bit because they depend on a new API to be available. And if the new API takes longer, then it takes longer for these things to actually come to fruition. And from the, of course, kernel CI test the kernel. The kernel has lots of different domains and subsystems. Um, so these play, of course, a really important part in, in the ecosystem. It's almost, I'd like to say it's almost like the core of the ecosystem. Um, so you've been, we've been doing uh, Clang builds for quite a long time now. Uh, I'd like to quote this email from Nick Desonia, who is one of the Clank um, Linux maintainers, he says he's always really, really happy to see all these um, email reports. Um, some emails are not very easy to read, some are a bit noisy, um, especially for test results. But for the bill ones, a few people have really said that, you know, even if they're not perfect, at least they provide some really useful information for them. And apparently that has worked quite well for, for Clang. We've worked also with um, uh, Miguel to add support for Rust. And I think Miguel basically owns this part of kernel CI now. Uh, at least, you know, I wanted to really make sure that 
uh, you would be able to add new versions of the Rust compiler, uh, change which branches needed to be tested, and you know the type of builds and, and all that. So I think that's working now, uh, which is a really good precedent. Initially, can also, the kernel CI team had to do all that, which doesn't really scale. Like if <laughs> that's one of the requirements that came out from the survey and discussing with people, people need to be able to um, join the join kernel CI and uh, use use kernel CI if you want without having to be directly involved with with a core team all the time. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet with V4L2. It's being tested, but that's, I think, still kind of more or less managed by the kernel CI call team. And DRM was tested for a while and then kind of stopped and nothing is coming back. There's lots of changes in DRM and, and they have their own uh, GitLab CI, but it's somewhere on, on, the, on the radar. BPF I just mentioned for patch testing and individual maintainers, like we said before, there's Arn Bergman and, and Mark Brown and Mark Kevin Inman, and there's maybe like 15 or 20 different kernel maintainers who have their own trees. So they play a key part as well in the ecosystem. How much time have we got? Um, yeah, it should be about time to do Q&A, but I still have a few slides to go through. So I go through them quite quickly now. Uh, yeah, stable reviews, this is something um, that started um, a few months ago. Is, yes. Sorry, there is one question. Um, oh yeah. What do you mean by kernel CI is not stable enough? Not stable enough. Yeah, somebody. I think they probably have gotten the impression that it's not stable enough. Okay. Yeah. Well, the new API is not finished. Oh well, well, there's two things. There's the legacy system, which is not reliable enough because it's kind of all technology and it's not scaling well. So like you said, like you should, like you saw a bit earlier, I was trying to show you some results and it was taking a long time to load, for example, and some things keep crashing and it's using Jenkins. And so that's one of the issues. If you want, the solution is to use, to have um, the new system in place and the new system is not finished. So I don't, don't really want to say it's not stable. Uh, because you can only judge whether it's stable or not what's in, in uh, like production ready state, but it's still in kind of beta early um, early stage. There's a number of things that need to be done for it to be really production ready. Uh, I don't know if that's the kind of thing we want to go through right now. Is that <laughs> there is one co help? a follow up question? I think you mentioned. Um, I think the clarification on the stable enough question. You mentioned it's not stable to be used as a blocker for the release of the kernel. Oh yeah, so that's not just kernel CI. That's the whole kernel workflow in general. Like right now, uh, for if you look at uh, you know I was mentioning stable um, stable releases and stable reviews a bit earlier. So for every uh, stable release candidate, there would be a list of all the patches sent to the mailing list as a thread to say, here's for the new 6.1.123 or whatever. There's a list of like 50 um, fixes, uh, and then people reply to say that they look okay or not. If, if there was an issue that was not reported, or if basically if only one person replied to say it looks okay, then I think the um, um, the stable release would happen at that point anyway. Like there, there's no way, there's nothing to completely verify that things are actually passing. There's no documented set of tests and set of things that need to be passing. There's no quality, there's no control quality level if you want. It's more like if nobody complains, nobody reports a new issue that's a um, deal breaker, then the release happens. And lots of testing happens separately from from that release phase, because actually, um, especially that's that's for stable that happens you know several times every week. If you look at mainline, um, um, there was a release I think a couple of years ago. I like the um, I like to take this one as an example. I think it was five dot four, but yeah, when it got released. Um, so it went through all the RCs and people tested and all that and replied and then it got to 5.4 and then in the store that said okay now it's released please go and test it <laughs> go and try this new kernel so that shows basically that people the, the, the kernel mainline release 
is just a code. You know, it doesn't come with any um, quality level. You don't know whether it's actually working or not. If, if nobody has re reported a problem, it doesn't mean that there's no problem. There's there's no requirement to say we need to have these things really working. Um, so testing happens kind of in a different universe from development. If in I a may, real in a real process. That, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If I may, let me clarify that. Um, the When the release, uh, kernel uh, release comes out, yes, you are right. Uh, Linus asks people to test. So it is not that none of the tests are run. Uh, various maintainers make sure that they have run their tests and they have done their regression tests before they send a pull request. If you were to send a pull request to Linus and Linus finds a problem, and that's not a situation any maintainer wants to be in. So mm -hmm. a lot of the code stays in Next and gets integrated over a period of almost four to six weeks. After the merge window, we don't put any new features into the kernel after RC1 comes out. And after that, maintainers are submitting their code into Linux Next. And it is being integrated, it is being tested by various um, test strings and then also users. So the test. So I am. I'm. I think I'm questioning the statement you're making, that it is just code. It's not tested. It is tested. Uh, we do not have access to all of the systems out there, all of the use cases out there. So is it tested on all of the use cases and all of the available systems out there? Because Linux Linux obviously runs on. Um, 30 some architectures and then uh, maybe thousands of, or if not ten, tens of thousands of systems out there. So, um, yes. the, so the, to clarify what you're saying, I'm putting a context around it that what we are saying is we haven't tested the entire universe that Linux runs on. Please tell us if we broke anything uh, because yeah. we humanly is not possible to test. That's where kernel CI and Linaro test strings are all very important uh, to the ecosystem to make the quality releases quality releases. Yeah, I think my statement was more like if you get a tag, a release, you know, what is being delivered in mainline is really just a code. You you know that people it's like best effort for testing things and people have tested it and have tried to run all the tests that they think really matters. Uh, but it's not documented really with the release, you know, to say this kernel has been tested uh, this way. And, you know, there there isn't a particular list of things that the kernel needs to be passing before the release happens. So um, I wanted to mention this, if you compare it with, a, um, I want to say, like a, a full modern uh, closed loop CI system where you have, like you know, on GitLab CI, for example, you can block changes until they pass a number of, of tests, and that could be just like starting just even with like a build. Can you build the x86 dev config? It's kind of assumed that it does, uh, but there's nothing anywhere that says it has to. <laughs> it's it's so, open. It's yeah. it's um testing is also just like the project, uh, code code writing and testing is also open source responsibility. Yes, you are right that there is no closed. Um, it doesn't happen on like a closed source system where you um, say release notes comes out and says, okay, these are all the things we verified. Yeah. So it's yeah. a different uh, testing philosophy that it's also user's responsibility to test the kernel. Yeah, and it's like I a think social, was, um... it's a social project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think you know I wanted to I started talking about this based on a question that was raised about why um what is not uh complete if you want in in the kernel testing and i think that's what it is because you know when kernel development started ci didn't really exist now if you create a new project today you would have ci from the from the day one if you want and very easily especially especially if it's a small project like an app or website you can say it has to pass the smoke test maybe pass some vm tests or whatever if some tests don't work, don't 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 pass, then the changes don't get merged. Um, we don't have that for the kernel now, and it's 
basically why I'm saying that testing happens in a separate uh, space, if you want, compared from development. So if, for example, um, so even if, you know, some people might re report a problem, at the end of the day, the maintainer says this problem is okay because we know uh, it's only on a particular type of hardware that nobody has, or it will be fixed by another branch coming from someone else. Even if things are reported as problems, the maintainers at the end of the day can decide to still apply the patch and still have it part of the release. Mm -hmm. um, that's something you can't have with a real automated um, closed loop CI system. And we don't so have. It's not. It's that's... not one. So somebody, um, yeah. I think, just uh, described it better, saying kind of distributed QA responsibility. Yes, it is. Um, it is yes. the responsibility of the community to make sure the release is good. And when problems are reported, you are right. Uh, maintainers will come and say, "Hey, yes, it. We know this is a problem. Um, however, it, uh, um, it it can be fixed, and they get fixed um, it, it, soon enough. So we don't have a CI system cannot block a release. You're absolutely right, uh, Guillaume. And now, there is one more question. Uh, would you okay. like to address that before you move on? Uh, I don't want to disrupt your flow here. No, that's fine. Okay. Uh, the test page uh, does not show the latest test results. What makes it wait so long? Wouldn't be, it be better if at least the values from a database from a while ago be were displayed? I guess they're asking about the das dashboard. Yeah, the legacy dashboard basically, I'd like to say it's broken. <laughs> um, it works because we're lucky. I think, you know, it's very old technology and has lots of issues. If it's not showing things, it's, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really kind of almost astonished it's still online and people still rely on it. Um, so, Improvements on the old web dashboard, that's basically, you know, not going to happen. <laughs> it's only like if something is really breaking in and it goes completely offline, um, then maybe a fix will be made for that. But now, you know, it really makes more sense now to focus on the new web dashboard, which should be online. Well, the plan was to have it uh, this summer, the actually written plan. Um, and for that, so I think that one of the best things to... Um, to do at this stage is uh, if you have an idea about how the web dashboard, how a good web dashboard would look like, uh, or what type of feature you want to see on the web dashboard, then you can you know send an email to explain it or whatever communication channel we might use on IRC even. Um, explain your idea and then it will have a chance to be factored in and be actually implemented for for the new web dashboard. I hope that answers the question. Yes, um, I did it might be a bit disappointing, question. but <laughs> <laughs> well, it's work in progress. Once you put in a dashboard yeah. and you are using it, um, it needs it needs to move forward, and that's what um, Kernel CI project is trying to do. So that's yeah. all good. Um, okay, so no more questions, uh, Guillaume. You can... Okay, so I'll go quickly through. No more questions here. I'll go quick quickly through the stable reviews. So that's something that started. Um, when initially it started several years ago, um, Kernel CI used to send replies automatically to uh, Stibon RC uh, email threads. Um, then it wasn't really well maintained and it started breaking and it was disabled. And then some people like me, myself included, at some point tried to um, reply manually to these uh, threads by looking at the uh, results from Kernel CI. So like, there's a new stable RC review thread um, that gets tested by kernel CI. You can go and see the results on the web dashboard in email reports. So the idea would be to kind of compile that, uh, compile a summary by hand, you know, come up with a list of regressions and things that seem really important to report and reply manually with that. Having in keeping in mind that it would be ultimately something to automate because it doesn't really scale to have lots of people doing like doing that all the time. Um, and then I think that got phrased as that got captured as a requirement for the new API and the new web dashboard and a new system, new notification system to be able to reply to uh, to emails with specific results like that. 
Um, and recently, at the end of last year, some people decided to have a look again and, and try to do this again, which is good, I think, from the point of view of um, engaging again with the, with, uh, with the kernel community. So in this case, it means there's a bit more relevant activity going on between kernel CI and, and stable reviews, so mainly Greg Hartman, but also everybody else who cares about stable quality. Um, however, it won't be completely fixed until we have automation for it, I believe, because otherwise it's not really sustainable in the long term. Uh, so here I've made a snapshot of um, a summary of the versions that are being tested now. Uh, it's only doing a... Um, a well, it's looking at the kernel CI builds and looking at boot uh, boot testing only. It's not looking at any more test results. Uh, and here it's showing the list of regressions that were identified and sent. Uh, so that's kind of also work in progress. Uh, this is the email from Greg Rodman when the, when the, one of the first reports like this was sent in December. Uh, so basically it's been like, you know, positive feedback so um we know we know that we'll always know there was a need for that um hopefully we'll have um an automated process for doing that soon and yeah part of the um like i said before you know one of the real key things for a true um ci system for the whole kernel community is to empower uh, kernel developers and maintainers to be able to um, to own their, their little part of well maybe a big part of, of kernel CI and, and how and and how it's testing their part of the, the the part of the kernel that they care about. Like I said, you know, for Rust, for example, it, it's really good to have the the Rust maintainer able to configure how kernel CI is testing um, is doing Rust builds in the kernel. Uh, having this kind of principle apply to everything, every part of the kernel would be really ideal. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to go through all the different details but uh, of how the new system is meant to work, but the idea was to basically have an abstraction between the runtime environments where builds and tests or any kind of job is being run and a test definition. That means... You can use the kernel CI infrastructure, you can use your own infrastructure, you can create a new type of infrastructure. So you can run a kernel CI job, ideally like on your own on your own laptop, on a VM that you own, or in a um, kernel CI owned part of the infrastructure with just a slight different command line option to say like your runtime is Molecule Shell, run, runtime is this Google VM or this Hetzner VM or the, whatever. You can create your own uh, environment for running tests if you want. Um, that's really useful for people who want to start um, automating gradually. So you can pseudo automate something uh, by using kernel CI to run things just in your, in your local shell and gradually go further than that to scale and run more tests in, in VMs and the cloud and all that. It's also useful to come back from that. So um, if there's lots of tests being run in the cloud and one of them is failing, for example, being able to rerun exactly the same test in your local shell means you can work on it and debug it more because then you can run it slightly differently to you know, get some debug output, um, run it again with a slightly different build with more debug options turned on and, and things like that. Um, so that's kind of this two-way process which I think is really a key thing here. And it's something you don't have in, or you don't easily have in, in normal CI systems. Uh, so for that, the idea was to have um, a command line tool called KCI. You would have things like uh, KCI run this job and KCI get the result and KCI send the result and stuff like that. Um, and um, yeah, so empowering developers from manual tests to full automation. And I'd like to say, and back from automation back to, to their local manual systems. And um, yeah, I've also highlighted here the main ways to get in touch with the kernel CI team. So there's a mailing list, um, which is hosted as a kernel mailing list. So it's also archived on law. Um, there's regular meetings. There's one every Thursday that's open to everyone. Uh, well, several of them. There's open open hours as well. 
and uh, ILC channel on Libra, not chat. Um, these, you know, really ways for anyone who wants, you know, whether you're kernel developer or test developer or uh, product product manufacturer, or, you know, anybody from the um, like from the ecosystem picture should be for anybody who has an interest in in the upstream kernel quality can just you know show up and, and start discussing things and that's how that's how the project grows uh yeah the that's basically a, a a summary of the the mission of kernel ci is to um automate factor out the um repetitive and difficult work of a maintainer a lot of things can be automated um and if we can rely more on, on machines, if you want on the infrastructure to do all these things, then people, especially maintainers, who can be really at the, I don't want to say the, I don't want to call them bottlenecks, but it could be really at the junction of a lot of code coming in and pressure to have things released. Um, so that's a huge burden. If automation makes this work easier, then it can just focus on the real things that make sense for, for a maintainer as a person to deal with. So like critical change, critical choices um, and, you know, connecting with other people and, and building the community. That's something you can't, you can't really do with a automated system. So that, that's the ultimate, um, I think, goal for, for kernel CI and what it stands for. Um, and I'm saying, I'm, I'm, here I mentioned the idea of a uh, synchronous CI loop. That's what I explained a bit before, so I'm not going to go through that again. But, you know, the idea of gating releases based on CI results. Um, it's something actually I talked about at Kernel Recipes a year and a half ago. Um, and I wanted to introduce something like um, a new trailer, a new uh, tag, if you want, in, in commits. Um, like you have link for a link to a mailing list discussion. You have uh, tested by and the name of someone who tested it. Um, what I proposed at the time was to add a test link. So it's like a link to a mailing list, but it points to a static page with a documentation about which tests were run um, for this particular uh, kernel revision. Typically, you would have that on, on a release tag, so on the stable tag or mainline tag maybe. Or maybe subsystem maintainers could do that for their when they send a pull request or for for their own um, their own management, uh, and I got some positive reviews and great comments, so that would be uh, very useful as well for um, people who build products based on stable, because that would give them already some paperwork about how stable the kernel is, how it's been tested before they add their own patches on top. So anyway, <laughs> related to synchronous uh, CI loop. Um, now I think we have a little bit of time left. Uh, yeah, in principle we have like fifteen minutes left. So feel free to ask any you know more questions at this stage. Um, but yeah, going forward, twenty twenty four. So now uh, Don Zikus from Red Hat has been elected as new chair of the board of um, members of the project. Uh, so he's been doing this since January 24, so it's still quite recent. Um, and Nikolai Kondrashov just got elected as new TSC chair, uh, and that will be effective on uh, 1st of April next week. No, in two weeks' time. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> Beginning of, well, 1st of April. And Shua has joined the TSC um, as a TSC member in, in March. So these are, uh, actually, I mentioned Shua here uh, as uh, because it's important, I think, to highlight when Colonel Maintainers um, join, join the TSC or people who were not necessarily um, core Colonel CI developers. Well, we've also had um, two or two or three people joining the TSC recently who had been Kernel CI developers for for a few years, um, and basically got more established in a project. If you want, are more like taking part in in votes and maintainers. So you can see that there's even the core team as well is growing. Uh, that's actually documented on the uh, 
on the kernel CI website, I can just quickly show you. If you go in documentation, you have the organization part, well, mission statement, but then you can see the um, Drizzery Ball, who's on the board here, and TSC, Technical Steering Committee. You can see all the members and uh, all the votes by the TSC are listed here. So you can see when, you know, I've all joined the TSC and uh, Jenny joined the TSC. And you, know, so you can see there's quite quite a lot of things happening in, in, in uh, have been happening in the past few months. Okay. Uh, yes. So it's kind of a um, bit of a new beginning in a way for the project to have a bit of um, new new people joining. Uh, of course, it means also that it requires transition phase when you have a new board chair as well as a new TSC chair. Um, and so it has kind of side effects in the short term. So I guess it will take a while. Maybe a very maybe not very long, but maybe it will take a you know a couple of months or something to start seeing the um, the results from it. So that I think it's kind of related to why we have um oh, sorry that's okay. why we have um some delay with the new API and and I wanted to mention to have something more concrete to show about the new web dashboard in this webinar. Like I actually put it in the abstract when I wrote it. I thought I would have something more concrete. We don't have it. We don't have it right now, but maybe in a few months, maybe in one or two months' time, there'll be like a, what we call a clickable demo. So something that looks like a web dashboard, uh, and you can click on it to open different pages and stuff like that, uh, but it's not with a real live database. Hopefully, we'll have something like this uh, in the near future. Um, so I've, put, um, I've got a few... Uh, words from uh, Don Zikus as the new board chair. So um, yeah, I asked him if he had, if, if he wanted me to, if he wanted to, to have um, a particular message added to this uh, webinar, because it's really about the project and not just my own story for <laughs> in kernel CI. So I think his main message is that there's no, um, there isn't going to be any major disruption, uh, at least not in the short term. The idea is to carry on with the same uh, momentum of the project and keep growing it, basically. And also um, a quote from uh, Nikolai Kondrashov, who's the new TSC chair. Um, and yeah, I think it's basically, um, you know, make the new kernel CI API useful ASAP that's basically catching up with the delay that's happened with deploying the new uh, and completing the new API. Um, so I think that's also kind of a line kind of about, um, continuing in the same, in the same direction. And then, uh, yeah, taking them slow down. So that's one of the challenges we have now. This is the Sydney Opera House, which is very famous for having taken about four times longer than originally planned to be, uh, finished. Of course, with kernel CI and, um, community projects in general, you can't really completely be sure of how long things are going to take because you don't have like one overarching entity who completely owns it. I mean, you have maintainers, of course, but it's not quite the same. I mean, it's probably true even for non-community projects. There's always like, of course, risks. And someone said the best way to make sure something doesn't happen is to make a plan for it. <laughs> Plans very rarely actually roll, um, you know, unfold as as they were uh, as they were created. Um, so it's kind of you know part of life if you want. Now, uh, but the new API has been delayed a few times, so I was really hoping that this new roadmap with some specific milestones, which I thought were a reasonable timescale, um, was going to happen. But there's been some uh, also some reshuffling around, and it's taking more time. Uh, so maybe, uh, also a bit later this year. Um, but yeah, the legacy system is really overloaded and uh, outdated. Um, and the new, new web dashboard needs, ideally, the new web API to be uh, stabilized before you can have actually a web dashboard to show the data from it. 
So, so for uh, yes. I think people that might not be familiar with the new API and how would you like to elaborate on that? What would new API, API the role API plays and how it connects dashboard and uh, the data? I'm assuming people could, uh, I mean, what what does this new API do? Okay. Um, uh, I think I, I've touched on this before. Um, I can explain it here, but there's also a blog post. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is this new API? <laughs> okay. Um, check. Yeah, that's good. I mean, people okay. can read the blog post. Yeah, I wanted to put the, the link here. Can you guys see the link I've posted? Yeah. But yeah, in, in a few words, basically, I mean, there's a database, as you would expect, with all the test results, with a web API on top to be able to send results and read results. So the web dashboard would be using that to show the, the results on you know uh, as a web dashboard or maybe bypass it and directly read from the database but it's more like implementation detail that's the very basic thing which you would not see with any ci system with a with a with a web interface now also uh what i think um, this new system would have would be uh user accounts so you can you know you would be able to see things anonymously as you know, all the data set would be public, but also by having a user account, you can save your own searches. You can um, opt in for specific notifications. So you would only get the emails that you care about to say, only send me a regression when uh, uh, Clank 13 build on ARM64 happens, you know, <laughs> uh, happens to China, for example. That's the kind of use case you would want to have, uh, want to be able to do. And then, um, also, um, the new API has uh, event mechanism, so it's not just passively reading and writing data. It's also um, acting as a way to orchestrate different things. That's something you normally, you know, in other CI systems, it's kind of built in. Here you have this very low-level way of um, orchestrating things just by sending events to say this new data just just came in uh, and that's all the API does. It doesn't say, now you need to run this build, you need to run this test. It doesn't say that. It just, it just says this new type of, this new piece of data just arrived and then something else on the client side can receive it. You might have lots of different services receiving these events uh, and deciding to do something with it. So as a user, you could say, okay, I want to get notified with an event from the API every time uh, a case self-test is failing, for example, or it's a case self-test regression has been found. And then you can have your own service that will do something locally on your, even on your own laptop. You know, you can receive that event and do something with it to, for example, um, run exactly the same case self-test, but with a different kernel build that has more debug options turned on. Um, you know, that's just a random example here. That's something you can do as even as a maintainer to automatically have your own particular type of debug being run, even without watching um, when a particular set of um, a particular type of event is sent. So that's just an example. And then these results can be sent to the web dashboard as well. You can see this maybe um, as part of your own data. And having events also means we can have more like um, real-time live updates on the web dashboard. So you can see this revision is being tested. This result just came in. This one is waiting for something. Uh, you know, uh, you could see that tests that are that haven't started started yet. So you could anticipate what is going to be run. That's the type of thing you would see with the new API in principle. Say I. Uh, uh maintainers run tests before they send it up. I, I run my tests before I send my pull request. Uh, could I somehow say feed it in using this new API saying um, this these tests passed on this pull request or on next, for example? 
uh, yes, um, I'm not entirely sure. So you you run some tests. Yeah, you can if you run some tests locally, mm -hmm. manually, you can have these results sent to the API. Definitely, yes. Okay, that's that's the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that that would be a lot of value add if we can, um, if if this API can enable maintainers to. Um, and contributors to report their tests, what they have done before they yeah. send it to the post. So that kind of shows um, then they could see potentially the, um, that before they send a pull request to Linus, there some of these tests are done. We may mention that in our emails, but it would be nice yes. to reflect that on a dashboard. Yeah, or you could even have, um, yeah, or you can make it part of your workflow if you write it in email in a particular way and have a service that listens for emails. Yeah. And then when it sees your email, it forwards the same parses type of data. It, to the yeah, parse yeah. it, parse it and yeah. nothing additional need to be done. You just send email and then, okay. So that sounds great. Yeah. Maybe that would be maybe slightly clunky. Like if you have the information firsthand, you could just send it to the API and also send an email, <laughs> but, maybe, but, it, but it's up to you. Um, like, you know, it's definitely something a maintainer could set up to not have to completely rewrite their own mm -hmm. workflow or whatever. You can create your own small Python script or something that will listen for IMAP emails and then pass it and send that stuff to the API if you wanted to. And then make it, then you can make it part of the main kernel CI tools if you want to as well. So, yeah. Okay, Candace is reminding us it's five minutes. Oh, I think it's now yeah. minutes. I think we're nearly so. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of ideas about what we can do after that. So, adding performance testing, stats based. Um, that's difficult to say. Stats based by section. Um, I, I made a talk about that at Plumbers a couple of years ago. And dynamic scheduling is about running fewer tests first and then deciding on the spot which other tests to run. Uh, based like if something starts failing you run more tests around that which is kind of like post regression checks um, if something starts failing you want to run more tests around that automatically to see how often it's failing if it's a stable failure uh, which is kind of related to um, performance testing and stats based so that's kind of ideas that we've known for a while that it, it would be really useful we've discussed with people at intel and others about their systems and that's a set of features that would really take it to the next level uh, but it was decided to you know there's no point trying to implement that with the legacy system um, so these are things also that are waiting for the new API to be implemented um, and so yeah now the project is basically trying to engage more with the kernel community again um, and yeah CICD has come a long way <laughs> Uh, with open source projects, as well, I said a while ago, you know, in the, when the kernel first started, uh, there, there was no real CI. And now every project you create, basically, you have CI for free and it's very easy to set up. Um, and I've, that's the last slide, I think. Yes, <laughs> brainstorming. Um, a few more ideas about where kernel CI might go uh, in the future. Some things people have said before is what about testing more than just the kernel? That's complicated, of course. Um, one example for that is currently Chrome OS. Um, it's not testing user space as moving target, but it's regularly upgrading to a new version of Chrome OS as a full um, user side stack. Uh, but in future, we could imagine like testing things like, I don't know, an Android snapshot or open embedded snapshot, and you have, instead of, the um, so, um, uh, what's it called? The, the product under test. If you want, instead of being just a kernel, you could have a whole OS image. You need to have one way to identify the version of that. Um, so that's something maybe that could could happen. Another thing that's really important is in uh, 2025, there's a European Union directive about um, basically reducing the um, well, extending coverage. It's like extending support from vendors, product vendors, um, for at least five years for the operating system. And I think it's maybe like seven years for the hardware. It's to avoid having lots of phones 
that come out with one release, maybe get to get a OS upgrade six months later, maybe a, month, a year later, and then they stop. And then you have lots of lots of devices with security vulnerabilities. This whole ecosystem based on trying to get people to buy a new phone every year, basically. So that's the kind of thing that the European Union is trying to change. And if you look at um, how Apple does it, I know Apple is not particularly a um, um, <laughs> big actor in the open source world, or they, they use like free, free BSD and things. Um, Apple have fewer products and support them for a very long time. And Chrome OS is a bit like that as well with Chromebooks. Um, but Apple is really doing it for a huge, um, much bigger volume. Um, well, Android is really, really the big, big, big volume. <laughs> yeah. And then Apple is a, is pretty big volume with, with iPhones too, and has support for several for several years. So I think following this example, uh, I think we basically uh, is basically what this is all about. And having a good CI system for that um, will help to improve. You know, the, uh, how long stable will be stable. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us today. Do we have like maybe one more minute for any last question? Don't look like we have any more questions. Yeah. Slide 38. Oh, that's just the link. Yeah. Okay. So um, thanks for, for realizing this and Candice as well and everybody at the LF. It's been great. <laughs> it's been great to be able to go through this. It's been an interesting exercise for me as well to kind of look back, look forward to the project. I hope it was uh, beneficial for people here. Thank you for doing this. Candice, back to you. Awesome. Thank you, Guillaume and Shua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.